Hey guys, Michael Owen. I want to thank you for tuning in. So just recently, and I'm talking about yesterday, we got into the middle of a contract and we landed this contract for $35,000 under what their asking price was. Now that's not too unheard of whenever we're buying houses from people with distressed properties. But this was a house that was on the market on MLS, which is a listing service that your realtor is going to be using. It's not so common to be getting those type of deals. As a matter of fact, I called up a couple of my friends who were also looking at this house and I told them, hey, what do you think I got this house for? Now, keep in mind, this piece of property, I'm not just looking at for residential. I'm going to turn it into a commercial piece of property. So I see bigger dollar signs with this whole deal. But I still negotiated like a champ. The listing price on this house was $160,000, but it's on a highway. That's ridiculous. Now, sure, it's a, it's a fine price for a house, especially a house like this one that needs a lot of work. We're talking probably $40,000 in work, which is why the price was so low. But if you start thinking about this commercially, we're talking maybe $500,000 to $600,000 so with the five to $600,000, you know where my mindset is going with this house and what I want to do with it. Now, obviously there's some hurdles that we have to jump over with the rezoning, going from the city. I get that. But either way, we got the house cheap enough to where we can get out of it residentially if we needed to. I didn't just offer them commercial prices knowing I was going that route. So the 160 house, my buddies thought, oh, the best that you could do negotiations might be 145, 150. As actually, there was another guy that already had a contract for 160. Didn't think he get it, could get the numbers to work residentially to where he wanted to sell it at 250. So I, I came in with my first deal at $100,000. You might think, ah, man, Michael, won't that upset somebody? Won't you just really make them turn off to the whole deal that you've been talking to you that you came with $100,000? Well, I came with $100,000 cash, uh, which really talks obviously more. And not everybody can do that. I get that. But there's some things that you can do with your contract to make it more appealing to them. And those things are really simple. It could be the fact that you pay for the title. It could be that you pay for the survey. And the different closing costs to where they're kind of getting a really easy deal with this. So just like I was telling my business partner, when we gave the $100,000 offer, he's like, ugh, that's a little low. And I said, no worries. They're going to come back at 130. And sure enough, they came back at 130. Well, from their 130, we counted at 115. They rejected our 115, but no worries. I live by the rule that there's going to be three moves in any contract negotiation. There's usually not going to be more than three moves, but there's going to be three moves. So in my mind, I know somewhere between our 115 and their 130 that we can make an agreement. Now it wasn't right in the middle. We ended up agreeing on 125. But if you think about how someone had this in contract at 160 and they couldn't make it work because there was maybe a $40,000 maintenance fee that was too much for them. We just made all of that maintenance up just with negotiations getting in at 125. That's all but $5,000 of the repairs and we made that up in our negotiations of the contract. So not every deal would be like this. Obviously a lot of the houses that you get might be from your mailers or your advertisements that you have. You're going out and you're talking to people. How do you handle contract negotiations with people that are living in the house? Super simple. I go by a little method here where when I first talk to them, I come to their house, I ask them, what do you think your house is worth? Like, what's the dollar value you have in your house? And they'll give me something back. Now, I'm already going to know the price per square foot in that area. So when they tell me that number, if it's low, I let them keep that number. If it's way too high, I counter it with, okay, well, how'd you get to that? Well, this is what I have, some validated information. I'm a real estate agent. I have access to stuff like this. And if you don't, if you're not a real estate agent, then you need to get access to stuff like this where you can show them the true values of their house. So that's where you start. Beyond that, I asked them, well, how much do you owe in your house? What's your payoff? Or how far are you behind? What's your, what are your, how much are you in arrears of on your fees? All these questions you might think, okay, I don't want, I don't feel comfortable asking that question to somebody 
That question can be a really personal question. I don't want to ask that question. Well, you need to ask that question. And odds are, most people are not going to tell you to write them out anyways. Now, if they bring out a piece of paper, it's something that came to mail recently, yeah, that's good. But what I found, about half and half, if they even tell you the right number on that. And why do I want to know that number? Well, I want to make sure that I can make this deal appealing to them. So if they're in some hard financial place in their life right now, and I can make a $5,000 deal to them on top of what they owe, that's what I sell it as. And then I'll end up paying the closing so they can have that $5,000 to move on and not just be stuck. The follow-up question I will ask is, well, what do you want? Some people might just come straight back is, I just want out of this. I just want what I owe so I can get this burden off of me. And if you can just help me out with that, that would be great. So congratulations if they ever tell you that because that is just free money to you. I still would encourage you, do something nice for them. Unless there's just no room in this for you with the math, do something nice for them. Help them move on with their life. If it's a thousand dollars or five, whatever it is, but do something good for them. Put the goodwill forward uh, to help them better their life. So if they're not just a slam bam of a deal when they say, I just want what I owe, and they came with some number way higher than what you're expecting to offer, now's the point where you start, need to start bringing up all of the repairs that you know the house needs. Because in this conversation you've been having with people, you went on the tour of the house, you saw the repairs that need to be done. Hopefully you were taking notes on that. Now you start bringing that repairs. Well, sir, you know the roof is damaged on the back side, and I'm expecting to at least replace the whole roof. It's going to cost me $5,000. There is some drop in the foundation in the back corner of the house that my foundation guy, I know him very well, is going to run me anywhere between $3,000 and $8,000 on this type of a job, which I won't know until I get into it. The carpet is going to need to be replaced, the painting, the air conditioner needs to be tuned up or replaced. These are all things that I will list and I will put a price tag next to each and every one of these. And then I will throw in other things as far as if you sold this on the market, you're going to pay real estate fees of 6%. So I'll go ahead and take this number, I'll take off the 6%, I will take off the repairs that would have to be done, all the repairs that he would have to do if he sold this house on the market. It starts to make sense in their head. Now's the point that you can come back with them. The number is logical in their head now. Now you can come back with them at your offer. Sure, they may say, no, oh, I can't really do that. Can you do a little bit more? Well, hopefully your first offer was low enough that it gives you room to be able to come up just a little bit. So now you've at least put a solid number in front of them. You've gave them reasons on why they need to come down. You gave them a reasonable expectation of what their house is worth and it makes it more probable for you to meet in the middle. So that's how I tackle houses where people are living there and they're about to lose them. Another house or another situation you may come across is a vacant house. The vacant house, you can almost always get a good deal in a vacant house because somebody is having to make payments for that house to still be vacant. There's still taxes, there may still be electric, and there may still be water. And there may be, still be insurance or even a mortgage that's still in this house that's vacant. So if it's vacant, be more aggressive with your negotiations in that and expecting that people are really needing to offload this house. So guys, in recap, we talked about the contract negotiation that we had and how we won on that contract. We talked about how you negotiate with people that are wanting to sell their house and they're living in. And we talked about vacant houses. Hopefully that was some good information to you that you can use out there in the streets and getting the best deals possible by understanding how to negotiate your contracts. Hope you enjoyed it and be blessed.